I'm going to uh, hand over to uh, standing man, uh, front man, rock and roller extraordinaire, uh, Dean Forrest. Morning, Dean. Good morning. Um, thanks for that introduction. That was very nice. Um, okay, so uh, I'll go straight into the questions, shall I? Yeah, Dave, do us a favour. Just, just for um, one thing, I forgot to ask you. Is just say just who you are, obviously, and like, but where are you from? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so um, my name's Dean Fairhurst. I am a songwriter, an artist, a singer, a guitar player, musician, and I'm from Warrington. Um, I was born in Whiston Hospital. Um, yes, I grew up grew up around um, a little village called Burton Wood. Um, it's where I currently reside at this moment in time. Um, yes, let's get straight into the questions, shall we? Um, first question is, how did you get into the industry? So, uh, for me to explain how I got into the industry, maybe I need to start a little bit from the beginning of um, becoming obsessed with creation, really. So, I got in it through the back door. Um, of the music industry anyway and I started off it was I believe it was in when I was about 14 years of age when I was in high school and it was initially from the creative side it was from a teacher uh, a drama teacher her name was Miss Shinkfield and she in tandem with with my brother James introduced me to the world of theatre uh, a lot of sort of playwrights I became obsessed with at that age, likes of Bertel Brecht and uh, Wilde, Henrik Ibsen, those artists that could define life in, in in one sentence seemed like magic to me. I became quickly obsessed with how art could take you away from from normal life and, and the, the strains and stress of normal life and and put it in such a way that you could find an equilibrium of yourself and and be, you know, view a path of how you circumnavigate through life and relationships and love and those things. So I got obsessed with those things and uh, I delved into to, to what would be my journey in understanding art and creation and and I was always obsessed with music my father was a he, in his spare time he would sing in an Irish band and I'd see at a young age him performing uh, a number of sort of Irish songs and all different types of music he, he would sing um, throughout sort of the country so even at, I think at the age of 12 I, I, I seen him perform in pubs and clubs and stuff like that. And um, then I got, I, I ended up self teaching, uh, I self taught myself the guitar and dabbled with the piano a little bit and, and became enthralled with how music is put together. You know, I think it was my mum that introduced me to the Beatles. Once that door was open, I, I started delving into who inspired them. And I, I, I just became obsessed with absorbing everything about music. I, I would watch endless amounts of content of <clears throat> documentaries on, on bands coming through the 60s and the 70s. And, you know, I set about putting together a, a, a band, which would be Sly Diggs. We'd end up terming it. That was the name um, that we give a few years later. But I, I started that with a friend of mine at the time, which was Louis Mengai. And we started writing songs pretty early on before we could sort of play our instruments. So we, we, were, we were writing in the same time of us learning our instruments. So we'd have a tape recorder and we'd, we'd put together riffs and we'd, we'd, we'd create riffs and create songs and, and begin writing songs together. Um, then we introduced another friend of ours who was a drummer at the time. I, he couldn't play the drums, so we, we, we forced him to, into buying a drum kit and learning how to play the drums to some degree. And the bass player, again, that was the same idea. After a few years of us 
playing we we, we wanted to get out into the public and we we play a number of gigs in pubs and clubs i think the first gig we ever played was in Earlham in some divey pub where i, I, we, we, I think we got 800 pounds for it and it was the most money we'd seen <clears throat> for a few years after that anyway i don't know how we got the gig but we did halfway through the set i remember um because of the the the, the style of the pub there was a lot of workers in high visits and rigger boots and someone came over and, and told us that we needed to turn it down and the drummer wouldn't go on in the second half and it was just a it was a it was a strange experience and we were already facing adversity on our first gig which was funny and instead of most people probably would have stopped after that we carried on and and we ended up getting different members in the band and realizing that we needed to um buy equipment so a PA system was was something that we we realised that we needed, obviously to 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 continue to write songs and perform them and rehearse them. Most importantly, so we began putting together a tour of Ireland for 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 a number of years, where we would travel around Ireland, living in in the back of a van. Um, we'd have like a partition sort of floor base where we'd put the equipment underneath, and then we'd sleep on the top. And we travelled around Ireland, playing the pubs and the clubs, a number of covers um, and a few of our own songs. And we did that sort of three, four hour sets each night. Some of the best times of, uh, of our lives. And, but we quickly got to grips with what you have to do as a performer, how to keep, sorry, how to keep a uh, crowd interested how to work with hecklers or how to work with people that, you know, enjoy the nights. We didn't actually get that much heckling, so that was a lie. But um, so we quickly got into that. As we came back, we, we were able to buy our own PA system. Then we got into the realms of, of developing our, or developing the songs that I was writing at the time and, and, you know, pushing in the direction of wanting to make it, as they say. Uh, in 2008, we ended up signing a record deal um that was after just after we we'd got into the realms of putting together a record you know we, we had zero experience of of being in a studio but we just went for it i i, I befriended a, a producer at the time that i'm still friends with uh, a guy called john kettle who works um he, he was a wigginer he'd been in a number of bands he was great. He was great meeting John. He was he was a character that that he seemed to resonate the same ideas and um, idealisms of uh, of being a musician and being an artist. He, he's very creative. He's very good in being able to drag out to view things that you didn't think you were, you had, and and uh, he was very good in. He was a big part of my sort of career into the industry. Um, certainly hearing stories, a lot of things of, of what you find as musicians and artists in the music industry is that uh, meeting people like that, that they're the ones that end up influencing you a lot because there's always stories of ups and downs and, uh, and I'd loved hearing those stories and, and that sort of drove me on to, to, to you know, further my career. Um, so then with these records, I think we put a record together. They were all demo tracks. So if, if no one knows what a demo track is, it's sort of not a fully produced record as you would hear on the radio. I, I viewed them as a demo track. They were, they were the starting point of we're putting down the bones of a track. And then ultimately, if we could sign a record deal, I'd like to record them properly. That's how I thought it was anyway. And we recorded about 12, 15 tracks, I believe. And then quickly after that, we started sending them out to record labels and we got, we signed a record deal in, in 2008, uh, 2008, I think it was. Um, and from that, we, we, we put about releasing the track. The, the, the label wanted to release the, the demo, so I was a bit confused at the time, but went along with it. Um, they released the record, did, did okay from the press point of view, but unfortunately, we were sort of the cat before the horse, and there was a few things that 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 stopped us um, further in that. In terms of, we didn't have a tour at the time, and, and we didn't have a booking agent 
um, which again, we were just learning what is a booking agent. I thought people just came and, you know, gave you gigs and, and signed you up and they take it from there. I didn't know anything about the industry and quickly had to understand the hard way of, of what specifically or what team specifically you need behind you to make it success or how do you form? It's not just a label that you need, you know, it's, it's everything else. So um, we toured that album just around the UK for a year. And then we were getting to grips with social media was getting big then at the time. And we quickly learned as a band of how, how social media can impact and help you branch out to the people and fans and collect fans as you know a lot quicker than you would do in the 60s and 70s and 2000s before the internet right so we we uh we put together a video a music video ourselves all it was all done ourselves and we posted it online and then there was a, a lady from the industry called emily smith who kindly passed on our video to uh, another gentleman called Paul Kramer, who was connected to a management company called Trinifold Management, who was headed by Bill Kirbishley and Robert Rosenberg, who were veterans in the industry from a, a rock point of view. And they'd worked, you know, with bands from anything from Led Zeppelin to The Who to Judas Priest and UB40, spanning incredible career. Um, and they wanted to meet with us. So we we all went down to London in a very daunting office with a lot of gold records on the walls. And um, they were interested in seeing us live. They, they, they loved the record. They loved the demo album, as, as I deemed it. And, you know, they had an idea of wanting to record that again, maybe. Um, but they wanted to see us live. They wanted to see what we were like live. And so they came down to a number of gigs that was, some of them were, I, I remember one of the gigs that they first came down, I think it was Robert that came down to a show in London in Hoxton. And and it, if anything could have gone wrong in that gig, gig, it did. Like the electricity went off at one point, the fire alarm went off. I think the drummer's pants fell down at one point. And we uh, we got through the gig we, we, we smashed the gig and Robert loved it. And then finally, Bill came down to um, a second show, which was in a festival in the Cotswolds. It was Jamie Oliver's festival, which is which is quite funny. It was a food festival, so it wasn't as rock and roll as, um, as you'd think it was. But again, we played that festival and we did a great show and, and we moved on to they offering us a, um, a management deal. Um, that management deal turned into um, <laughs> we got offered then a support for for the Who. So if you imagine as we were playing in capacities probably around 500 people venues, to then being offered um, arena shows in the UK, which was the first one I believe was um, was it Liverpool Liverpool Echo Arena, and we went from there. Then um, we ended up getting a booking agent and. Did a good few tours around the around the US and Europe, sporting the Who, and then Liam Gallagher and Rich Ashcroft, the Killers, and a band called Vintage Trouble, <coughs> um, playing some huge, huge festivals, playing the main stage at Isle of Wight, and, and it went on from there. Really, um, that was my way into the music industry. Great, right. like there's um, I, th I do think you you missed out. One of my favourite stories is about when you were doing the streets in Ireland, and I think it's it just depicts what the graft was when what you were living off while you were getting your busking money. Yeah, well, in that time we were very young, and um, I think our diet consisted of just Guinness and cooked chicken. So <laughs> you can imagine how badly that van smelled. Um, <clears throat> great. The, um, yeah, just I, I'm just, just mindful of time. So if we go on to um, the next question, I think, what challenges did you face? What challenges did you face? Um, we faced a lot of them, a lot of them that could come our way. We faced them all. Um, the challenges that we looked at was, you know, trying to find a manager. We, we went through a lot of managers, um, 
all with the best best intent best intentions for us you know one thing i did realize is that you know if you have a modicum of um ability there's a lot of people in the industry that want to help you and want to be a part of your journey and, uh, and want to share the, the fruits of your labor as well in the sense of the enjoyment of actually succeeding at something because it's such a a a, a interesting industry you know you find very interesting characters. Um, so a lot of things that we found was having no money w w was a thing that we focused on because you have to, when you're working in the music industry, it's a full-time job. So, so then f finding work uh, in between to, to pay for your life, to pay to survive is very difficult. So the balances of, of having to live in normal society and also be a creative and also be a songwriter and also work every evening and every possible minute that you have to yourself on music is um becomes such a challenge in the respect that you're aiming for the things that you desire but without any rule book there's no rule book to tell you how you do this because there's so many ways that people have succeeded whether that be from luck of someone finding you on the street busking or whether that's someone finding you through social media or whether it's, you know, you gig around the UK for years and years until someone finds you then, you know, you always have to rely on someone else that's going to open that door for you. So you could be the greatest musician, greatest songwriter, but without those other people in the industry or that bit of luck, you know, it's very difficult. So, you know, we were also told uh, no a lot, um, a lot of labels that said no, we weren't, the style of music wasn't vogue at the time, so we just come out of the end of of the sort of 2000s, you know, the scene of Arctic Monkeys and, and the Strokes and, the, uh, and Sabian and all those bands that were big at the time, that had sort of began to die off. So we were dealing with, you know, being part of a genre that was somewhat certainly in the UK was you know being ostracized a little bit I think it is still now so that was hard you know the, the, the difficulties of of, um, of being two people um, I, understanding my understanding at a young age was that I got into music because I couldn't function in the normal society of of finding a nine-to-five job or becoming a businessman or working on a building site, I, I, I couldn't see myself doing that. So I, I wasn't of that mind. So, but when you got in this day and age of, of being a musician or being an artist, you have to have that duality of, of two people. And I found it difficult. I found it difficult of saying, well, the reasons I got into music was to fight against that because that wasn't me. But then you quickly understood that you, you have to be those two people. And that, that was a challenge in accepting those things. It took me a long time to accept it. Um, and that was, a, that, was, that was a huge challenge, I think, you know, keeping the focus of being able to be those two things. Um, okay, the third question is, what are your career highlights? I had a number of career highlights. I, uh, signing with Trinity Fold was, it was a huge thing, you know, hearing the stories and, uh, and meeting people in the industry like Bill and Robert and, and having them tell you that, you know, they love what you do. That was a great uh, confidence booster in, in understanding that's a notch to say that your, your choices in your creation is, you know, is a, a certain quality. Hey, I'm, I may, I may have already missed this because I'm just, I'm also trying to write notes of what you say so I can tweet later, but have you t told people about who Trinifold who are and the, the legacy yes. of the people they've looked after? Great. Yeah, so, the, so Trinity Fold and Robert Rosenberg and Bill Kirby, they have looked after a number of bands. I think Bill was something to do with uh, back, way back into the 60s of all different types of bands, but they look after and had looked after the likes of Led Zeppelin and The Who, Judas Priest and UB40 and numerous other bands. Um, so, and obviously the, Bill and Robert had worked in the, the, the film industry. Um, for doing a number of the films of Quadrophenia and um, MacGyver as producers. 
Um, so yeah, I signing with them was was a big highlight for us, for me particularly. Um, going on to a, a US tour around the North America, that was a big thing. Um, first time being on a tour bus and living the life of that you'd always dreamed of, traveling around and waking up in a different state, physically and and mentally, um, which was good, you know. Traveling the world was always something that I wanted to do in my life, whether even if it wasn't music, God forbid, because I was, you know, I think now in this day and age, having the ability to travel, it does broaden your mind, the cliche that it is, but it's such a luxury that we have in this day and age to be able to travel and meet new people and meet new cultures, most importantly, because culture and different cultures influence you greatly without even knowing it. Um, so that tour of America was was a big thing and playing, you know, Staples Arena in, in LA where so many historical events had happened and we we had standard innovations at every gig uh, in that US tour, which was which was great for for four lads from Warrington. Um, you know, another career highlight I'd say was the Royal Albert Hall. I remember being filmed for a music TV show a few years before and they were asking. What were the vets? Now you've played the O2. We played two nights at the O2 in in um, in London, and someone asked, oh, "Where would you go next?" Sort of thing. And I said, "I'd always love to play at the Royal Albert Hall." And sure enough, we got an opportunity a year later to play for Teenage Cancer Trust, um, which is a great charity, and we were supporting Def Leppard, and we played the Royal Albert Hall, which would all those sort of documentaries and, and artists like Bob Dylan and even I think Ali fought there and just like steeped in incredible history and to be able to even just perform there, it was like a huge honour for me. And the, the the sound in there was like, it's the best I've ever heard, I think. So it's a good thing to notch on a, on, on my CV, as they say. Um, what career advice would you give your 16 year old self wow that's a big question um be more ruthless with myself i don't think I, I was ruthless in many ways with how i uh my tenacity to to get up and, and use every time possible on my hands to to spend absorbing listening to music but i'd be more ruthless in understanding myself and understanding what my pitfalls were I think you can get blinded by, because when you're in it, life seems to me very fast and not taking that moment to stop and understand what I truly want and, and holding on to your own in integrity and, and being proud of, of doing that. You don't have to do it with meanness with anyone, but you have to be ruthless with yourself to, to you know, to give yourself the gratification that you deserve. Um, I, I'm, an, I'm a Northern man, so, you know, and I'm English, and we have that side of our personalities that we say sorry a lot. And I think it's useful in some respect, but a lot of it's not when you're an artist. You know, you have to understand what your capabilities are, and it's good to tell yourself that you're great at those things, and it's okay to say yourself you're not very good at those things, and you have to accept those things. Um, so accepting the things that you can't change, you know, and changing the things you can. That, that, that's a thing I'd certainly tell myself at, at 16. Um, number five, who are some of the people that have helped you? Um, family, family has been a huge thing. Um, for all the bands that I was obsessed in the 60s and 70s, they didn't have that. And I always thought that was quite interesting. A lot of people trying to get into the industry then in the 60s and 70s, probably even into the 2090s as well with bands like Oasis that I don't think they had the same support as musicians and artists get now from from the parents the people that are lucky enough to, to have the support from the parents um you know they 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 believed in me and my father my mother certainly my brother uh, uh pushed me to 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 believe in myself and believe in the art that I was creating um we met a lot of managers along the way a lot of people I'd mentioned before in the industry that that are on the periphery of bands and artists 
they want to be a part of something. But every last one of the managers, and we had many from all different characters over the world, and they wanted the best for us ultimately. And you always learn from those people, the good and the bad. I, I learned a lot from them. Um, they helped out in, again, believing in yourself and believing that, that what you want is right. You know, um, bands and other artists, other artists that we met along the way, there was, we made friends with a band called Vintage Trouble. Um, Ty Taylor is, is, a, is a great character. He was very good in defining um, who he is as an artist. And that was inspiring, you know. Um, Pete Townsend and, and, and Roger Daltrey gave us some great, um, great advice in terms of, you know. It's 10 hours. Staying true to yourself. And, um, you know, there's other, other people in, in the industry as well, like um, other businessmen that are not necessarily in the music industry that have been able to provide me with advice. There's a gentleman called Adrian Burns from, from Burton Wood. He's a self-made man, and and he thankfully has uh, has provided me with a lot of of knowledge to deal with certain aspects of the industry that, as I mentioned before, you have to be um, privy to and understand them. So read them and understand them. Next question: um, What advice would you give to someone wanting to go into your career now? First and foremost, I wouldn't. It's important not to be scared of people saying no to you. You need to hear it because if you get things so easy, I don't think you ever appreciate the, the glory parts of, uh, of being a musician and being an artist. You have to be ruthless, as I mentioned before, in terms of what I wish I had. Or what I just told my sort of 16 year old self is being ruthless in every aspect. And by ruthless, I don't mean you have to be mean and you have to treat people with disdain or anything but it's about being ruthless to understand what your goals are and what your your dream is you know your short-term goals your long-term goals you you have to give that commitment every day of your life from the morning that you wake to the to the moment that you fall asleep and even in your dreams you've got to be dreaming about music you've got to be dreaming about creation you've got to be dreaming about pushing the zeitgeist you've got to be dreaming and understanding what your strengths are you know being hard faced, being in the midst of it, you, you have to be in it to win it. So you have to be visiting those people. Who are your heroes? How do they get there? Understand how the work that they've put in to get there. You, you know, people spend years and years to become an overnight success. And it doesn't just happen with, you know, a drop of luck. You always need that element of luck. So you have to be accepting that fate and your fate will always land in the hands of of the gods of whatever that is but you have to be in it in a position to be able to have that so you have to create a lot of your own look um you have to understand that that's a part of life and and of course it might not work of course all your hard and work could come to nothing but you have to be accepting of that and i think that's what makes the industry beautiful you know um that's why it is what it is. You've got to fight for, for, for your integrity is another point I'd, I'd certainly make. Um, it's quite easily, it's quite easy to accept people's advice because they are part of the industry and I've had more experience, but you need to understand your own desires and needs and, uh, and stay true to yourself on, the, on those aspects. So keeping your integrity is, is a, is a major point and lastly I, I'd say you know stay away from mediocrity aim to be the best aim to be the best in your field aim to be the best in your genre otherwise there's not really any point of doing it you know because you're not really true to yourself and what legacy would you leave behind if you've not done that so die for your art that's the one I think that's my Great. Yeah, brilliant. Well done, Dave. Oh, that was brilliant. I loved hearing that. And even though some of it, uh, a lot of it I've heard, heard myself. Two seconds while I, my daughter's just going fishing. 
I mean, um, still on mute, right? Uh, but yeah, that was great, and there's lots of things that I've heard up or reshaped there really nicely for other people. Um, what we're going to do before, um, and we slightly run over, which is fine, I think, when you're getting stuff like that. But uh, has anyone got any questions? I'm gonna, uh, yeah, Laura's sticking around up. I'm gonna just change, take you off. Um, there you go, I'll move back to gallery view. So that you're oh. not great. Uh, Laura? Hiya. Um, I've got a couple actually. Someone sent some in, so I'll start with them first. So, when writing a song, how do you structure when writing? And also, what comes first, melody or lyrics for you? Um, I've always been of the thought that you've got to always keep changing as an artist. Bob Dylan is, is very good at that. The likes of David Bowie are very good at that of changing um, their way they do things just to keep things fresh. So that's, it, it all depends on how I'm feeling. Um, Keith Richards says, you know, writing songs, and as a songwriter, you stick your antenna uh, antenna up in the air and you're waiting for something to happen. So it could be anything. It could be a melody that that hits you, whether I'm dreaming something or a melody hits in my head, and and I'll start from there. Or it could be that you're putting together chord structures and become obsessed with that chord structure and play it and play it and play it until all of a sudden the melody starts. Um, so yeah, it changes. It changes quite a lot, really, um, from even you know finding a title. I know I know that there is a there's a great book called Isle of Noise, um, and it was written about all its interviews with all different songwriters <clears throat> from. Um, all different songwriters from uh, Ray Davis and Noel Gallagher and, all, and they explain their process of how they write and, it, and it's interesting in the aspect that everyone writes differently but a lot of them say that there's different ways of writing they don't all just stick to one way of doing it so it could be a title, it could be a melody it could be chord structures, it could be anything um, it could be thematic thematically I, I know like something that I've done on, on a new album that I've recorded at the moment a lot of themes of the song came after the chord structure that I put together. A few songs I'd put where I developed the song as I was recording it, which is something new to me. So yeah, always keep changing, I think, because it keeps it fresh. And then, and then with that, do you like to collaborate or work alone? You know what? I, I, I don't mind collaborating. I wrote a few songs <clears throat> only, only recently. Um, and by recently, I mean last couple of years, with another number of people that I met, a gentleman called Steve McEwen, who's who's a songwriter, who's worked with everyone from Eminem to Robbie Williams and all different types. He's he's a great guy, and that was my first introduction with writing someone else. With someone else, I'd wrote a little bit with with the lad who I started the band with, Sly Diggs, with Louis, and I, I enjoyed collaborating I, one, one of a, a regret that I had was not writing more with him I think because we sort of became obsessed with our own writing style that we separated a little bit and and I, and I regret that a little bit so definitely I'd, I'd love to collaborate with more people I, I do enjoy it because you, I say yes a lot more than I, than I ever did when I was younger so yeah I think that, did I answer your question then <laughs> Great. Anyone else? Who's the best tour manager you've ever had? Um, <laughs> I could ask you another one. Shall I yeah, ask you yeah, another one? Bit, well, you yeah. know when you're recording? Yes. You, what, what goes down first or does it depend on the sound? <clears throat> um, it depends. You can go into a studio with a full track and like one track on, on the most recent album, we recorded it in one take. And that was it, bang, finished, and, and you put the vocals down. I, I, it's always the vocals that'll go on last and the harmonies that'll go on last. Um, but depending on how I worked on, on this most recent album, other albums and other tracks that I've recorded, sometimes differently, but people have different ways of uh, recording. The T-Rex usually built a song up by recording an acoustic and then building everything on top of that, which is a good way of doing it, but just a different way of doing it. 
now we'd, we'd usually put like guitars, bass, um, drums down as a basis. And then the vocals on top of that, any overdubs and stuff like that would, is, is a good way to do it. Dep it's depending on how you record it in this day and age. If you've got, if you're in a big studio and you have the luxury of being in a the studio, then recording the drums, the guitars and the bass all at the same time is a good way to do it for my, my idea. I just thought of, a, thought of a question before I let you go. Um, but I'm, I'm interested. I mean, uh, on here there's, there's people from different disciplines. But what do you think? You know, there are a hundred uh, of different various levels of people who've just picked up a guitar like you that are at the beginning of their journey of musicians. What do you think is about artists from Warrington? Like, the, the, what what do you think is about Warrington that that with a place that doesn't have, you know, fit for purpose producing theatre house or, you know, it's got some cultural stuff, but what do you think it is about Warrington that, that makes people try and find their voice through different arts, but, you know, spectrums of art, because you've got 100 plus bands, you've got people, and they do it sort of in spite of coming from a, a working class sort of yeah, industrial town? I think you have to work a lot harder for being in Warrington. You're, you're situated in between Liverpool and Manchester. So I remember at the beginning of my career of, of wanting to perform in, uh, in proper venues, music venues. Unfortunately, one doesn't have a proper music venue, which is unfortunate and always been, there, there has been venues, you know, there was WA1 um, and there's a Fry's Court, aspect but there's no in between you've got that and then the power all which is quite big so it's very difficult for artists being from Warrington because your closest place that you need to go and perform is Liverpool and Manchester and when you're starting out as a career anyone that wants to put a show on for you demands that you have a crowd because the night's got to make money hasn't it you know or the night's got to break even at least so you have to take all your fans into the cities and like Liverpool and Manchester which is crazy really because all you're doing is moving your fans to to go into Warrington and then uh, going to Liverpool, going to Manchester, and then come back home. Where you know it's 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 a, it's a strange way of doing it. So I think the, the challenge for for artists and bands in Warrington is that you have to work ten times harder to to build up to those, you know, getting those gigs in in Liverpool or Manchester. But it's, it's something that you have to do. So I think that. You know, there's there's something in Warrington that <clears throat> inspires people to create. There's so many great bands coming out of Warrington. Yeah, interesting that that you've got to take all your fans. You used to do it with coach loads. People would get on a coach at the Lee Arms in Newton and 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 and, and, and as far as we could. People from Newton and Warrington on a coach <laughs> of our fan base at the time was crazy. People yeah. like a good time. Right, brilliant. Th Dave, thank you so much. Um, that, that, it's been thoroughly enjoyable, and I've heard a lot of that before, but I think it was really, hopefully really useful as well uh, to the students and stuff that will watch this afterwards. So thank you very much, Gabe. Big hand. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Um,